Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is another special March Mystery Madness video. In this video I'm going to give you some more bonus recommendations for the prompt of color. I know that's um, for some people that's a hard one to find and for other people it's not but um, here are some more recommendations for you that would fit that prompt. But before we get to that, I need to tell you about the book that I found that fit yesterday's uh, prompts for our M&M Manuscript Matchup game. The prompts were to find a book that features a detective duo and is set somewhere in Asia. And the book that I found is called The Tokyo Zodiac Murders by Soji Shimada. And I'm going to put the picture in here. I read this book last year and I loved it. It's written very much in a traditional golden age style mystery. There's even a challenge to the reader, which I love. There's illustrations in it and, you know, maps and, and uh, floor plans. I loved it. I loved all of it. Um, it was translated by from the Japanese by Ross and Shika McKenzie. And the detective duo in this story is illustrator and avid mystery fan Kazumi Isho Ishioka and astrologer Kiyohi Mita Mitaraya. I'm sorry, I'm completely butchering these names. But anyways, these two um, become uh, really interested in an unsolved crime from the 70s called the Tokyo Zodiac Murders and so they set about solving that unsolved crime and it was a really great it was a really great mystery I really enjoyed it stay tuned to the end of this video when we will play another round of the marvelous and magnificent March Mystery Madness M&M Manuscript Matchup Game Here are some bonus recommendations for you for the prompt of color. I had so many that I wanted to talk about and it was too many to do for my original recommendations video. So here is some bonus content for you. Um, these are books that have um, a color or something related to color in the title. And the first, first up is uh, one of my Christie commendations, and this is Black Coffee. This is um, a, a novel created from the play. So Agatha Christie wrote a play in 1930 called Black Coffee, and Charles Osborne adapted it into a novel in 1997. I would love to get my hands on the original play and read that. I think that would be amazing. But um, without that, um, we can have this book that um, Charles Osborne uh, adapted from the play. <clears throat> An urgent call from physicist Sir Claude Amory sends famed detective Hercule Poirot rushing from London to a sprawling country estate. Sir Claude fears a member of his own household wants to steal a secret formula destined for the Ministry of Defense. But Poirot arrives too late. The formula is missing. Worse, Sir Claude has been poisoned by his after-dinner coffee. Poirot soon identifies a potent brew of despair, treachery, and deception amid the mansion's occupants. Now he must find the formula and the killer while letting no poison slip twixt his own lips. Okay, and then some historical mystery recommendations. This is The Golden One by Elizabeth Peters. This is from 2002 and it is the 14th in her Amelia Peabody series. A new year, 1917 is dawning and the great war that ravages the world shows no sign of abating. In these perilous times, archaeologist Amelia Peabody and her extended family must confront shocking dangers. But it is son Ramses who faces the most dire threat, answering a call that will carry him to the fabled seaport of Gaza on a mission as personal as it is perilous, where death will be the certain consequence of exposure. While far away, Ramses' beautiful wife Nefrit guards a secret of her own. 
Funeral in Blue by Anne Perry. This is from 2001 and it is the 12th in her William Monk series. This is a series set in Victorian England and I quite enjoy this series. Um, William Monk is a really interesting character. In the very first book, he wakes up in the hospital after an accident and he has lost his memory and he never really gets it back and that makes for a really, really interesting um, plot plot line, ongoing plot line. He doesn't remember, um, as a police officer, he doesn't remember his own co-workers, so he doesn't remember any of the potential fights or conflicts within his own uh, workplace, but it means he also doesn't remember um, past criminals or anything like that of people that he has put in jail. So it does lead to some interesting situations for him. <laughs> Two beautiful women have been found strangled in the studio of a well-known London artist. To investigator William Monk and his wife Hester, the murders are a nightmare. One of the victims is the wife of Hester's cherished colleague, surgeon Tur Dr. Christian Beck, a Viennese emigre who becomes the prime suspect. With an intensity born of desperation, Hester and Monk seek evidence that will save him from the hangman. From the city's sinister slums to the crowded coffee houses of Vienna, where embers of the revolution still burn in the hearts of freedom-loving men and women, they seek to penetrate not only the mystery of Eliza Beck's death, but the riddle of her life. A Double Death on the Black Isle by A.D. Scott. This is from 2001 and it is the second in her series. Nothing is ever quite at peace on Scotland's Black Isle. The traveling people are forever at odds with the locals, the fishermen have nothing in common with the farmers, and the villagers have no connection with the town. But when two deaths occur on the same day, involving the same families from the same estate, the Black Isle seems as forbidding as its name. Joanne Ross, typist at the Highland Gazette, is torn whether to take on the plum task of reporting on these murders. After all, a woman at the center of both crimes is one of her closest friends. Joanne knows the story could be her big break, and for a woman in the mid-fifties, a single mother no less, good work is hard to come by. But the investigation by the staff of the, on the Gazette reveals secrets that will forever change this quiet, remote part of the Highlands. The ancient feudal order is crumbling, loyalties are tested, friendships torn apart, and the sublime beauty of the landscape will never seem peaceful again. Death on a Silver Tray by Rosemary Stevens. This was published in 2000 and it's the first of her Beau Brummel series. In Regency England, Beau Brummel stood as the uncrowned king of genteel society. Beau Brummel is, was a real um, historical figure. Whatever he wore was the height of fashion. Wherever he went was the place to be. And the last place one would expect to find him was in the middle of a murder mystery. But then Beau Brummel was never one to do what was expected. When the Duchess of York asks for his help, Beau Brummel cannot refuse. The cantankerous Countess of Ryburn has been fatally poisoned and her paid companion, for whom the Duchess arranged employment, is the prime suspect. If the accusations prove true, the scandal would ruin the Duchess's good name. Brummel hastens to the Rayburn house and it doesn't take long to realize that more than one person had motives against Lady Rayburn. And Brummel is going to find out who because if there's one thing that's never in style, it's murder. Black Ship by Carola Dunn. This was published in 2008 and it is the 17th in her Daisy Dalrymple series. In September 1925, Scotland Yard DCI Alec Fletcher inherits a large house in Hampstead on the outskirts of London from a recently deceased great uncle. It's fortunate because he and his wife, the Honorable Daisy Dalrymple Fletcher, are the proud, recent proud parents of twins and their house is practically bursting at the seams. 
Though in need of a bit of repair and updating, this new, larger house seems a godsend. Set in a small circle of houses with a communal garden and with Hampstead Heath nearby, the setting is idyllic. Idyllic, that is, until a dead body shows up, half hidden under the bushes of the communal garden. Now rumors of bootleggers, American gangsters, and an international liquor smuggling operation via black ships have turned everything in their new neighborhood upside down. Alec is assigned by Scotland Yard to ferret out the truth behind the dastardly deed, but it's up to Daisy to find out who the dead man is, what his relationship to her new neighbors is, why he was murdered, and who did him in. <laughs> A Beautiful Blue Death by Charles Finch. This is from 2007, and it's the first in his Charles Lennox series. This is set in 1865 London. This is another series that I really, really enjoy. Charles Lennox, Victorian gentleman and armchair explorer, likes nothing more than to relax in his private study with a cup of tea, a roaring fire, and a good book. But when his lifelong friend Lady Jane asks for his help, Lennox cannot resist the chance to unravel a mystery. Prudence Smith, one of James, Jane's former servants, is found dead of an apparent suicide. But Lennox suspects something far more sinister, murder by a rare and deadly poison. The grand house where the girl worked is full of suspects, and though Prue had dabbled with the hearts of more than a few men, Lennox is baffled by the motive for the girl's death. When another body turns up during the London season's most fashionable ball, Lennox must untangle a web of loyalties and animosities. Was it jealousy that killed Prudence Smith, or was it something else entirely? And can Lennox find the answer before the killer strikes again? All right, and then some recommendations. Some recommendations from the golden age of crime or from vintage crime or um, classic crime, whatever you want to call this category. We have Black Plumes by Marjorie Allingham. This is a standalone from 1940 and it is set in London. Mrs. Gabriel Ivory was nearly 90, but she simply had to be told. Skullduggery was afoot at the renowned Ivory Art Gallery in Sallet Square. A series of malicious mishaps was pushing the family business toward ruin. But with proprietor Mayrick Ivory in China, his bumbling son-in-law Robert was incapable of handling the crisis. The slashing of a valuable painting was the last straw, or so the Ivory family thought until the night of the murder. That evening, someone removed Robert from the picture permanently. But who? Was it his ambitious assistant, Luker, his neurotic wife, Phyllida, the outraged artist, David Field, Mayrick's spinster secretary, Miss Dorset, or could it have been the indomitable Gabri Gabriel Ivory herself? And then we have The Yellow Room by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. I don't have the dust jacket for this book, unfortunately. This was from 1945. Upon reopening her summer house in Maine, 24-year-old Carol Spencer finds a charred corpse in the linen closet, and when Carol becomes the police's prime suspect, she attempts to clear her name by uncovering the real murderer. Red Threads by Rex Stout. This is from 1939, and it features Inspector Kramer. Nero Wolfe's cigar-chewing antagonist has a case of his own. When a wealthy man is clubbed to death at his Cherokee wife's tomb, Inspector Kramer must retrace the steps that led the victim from Oklahoma to Wall Street. The only clue is the piece of red thread the dead man was grasping. And this is another Rex Stout, but this is from his Nero Wolf series. This is Black Orchids from 1942. This is the ninth in that series. There is a killing at a flower show and a series of poison pen letters that result in murder. 
um, Nero Wolf discovers that there are only three black orchids in the world and they belonged to someone else. Picture Nero Wolf maddened by lust. He would do anything to get those orchids. The reader is also cordially invited to meet death in a story where Archie Goodwin trips over an alligator and lands in the middle of murder. <laughs> All right, and then we um, have The Golden Spiders by Earl Stanley Gardner. I'll open it up for you, but I absolutely love, I don't have the dust jacket, but I love that there's a little golden spider there. Hope you can see that. Oh, no, this is not Earl Stanley Gardner. This is also Rex Stout. This is another Nero Wolf. This is from 1953 and it is the 22nd in that series. Trying to determine why his last two clients were ruthlessly murdered, Nero Wolf wonders if the answer is linked to a young boy who turns up at his brownstone and finds clues in a gray Cadillac, a mysterious woman, and spider-shaped earrings. The a Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This, of course, is the first Sherlock Holmes story. Here is the first meeting between Holmes and Watson and Holmes's first fully documented case. Inspector Tobias Gregson calls the genius of deduction in on a bad business at Three Lauriston Gardens, where one Enoch J. Drebber lies murdered. The letters rock. Uh, scrawled in blood upon the wall. And keeping with the Scarlet theme, this is The Scarlet Letters by Ellery Queen. This is from 1953. For once, Ellery Queen had a simple case, a few days of discreet snooping, some choice advice, and the inimitable sleuth would blithely restore domestic harmony to the tumultuous marriage of millionaire couple Dirk and Martha Lawrence. And then came the scarlet letters. First, the anonymous epistles inked in red, in intimating dark secrets and desperate acts. Then the symbolic irony of the letters, condemning homely Martha as a flagrant adulteress. And finally, the cryptic alphabet clues scrawled in a murdered man's blood. A simple case? Ellery Queen had been a fool to think so, and unless he had some super fast sleuthing, He'd have nothing to show for his efforts but a very scarlet face and a killer on the loose. Um, this is The Case of the Green-Eyed Sister by Earl Stanley Gardner. Now we have Earl Stanley Gardner. This is from 1953 and this is one of his Perry Mason series. Sylvia Bain Atwood is a green-eyed beauty who is seeing red over blackmail. While her mousy sister devotes herself to caring for their father's health, Sylvia is looking out for the old man's welfare. That's why she's come to Perry Mason. It seems Sylvia's oil tycoon father, Ned, made his millions with seed money he borrowed from a bad seed named J.J. Fritch, who made his money by robbing a bank. Now, Fritch isn't threatening to tell the police how Ned Bain got filthy rich using dirty money unless the oil man agrees to grease Fritch's itchy palm. And then we have The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I will use any opportunity to recommend this book because I love it so much. This was published in 1860. Wilkie Collins is a contemporary of Charles Dickens. On a moonlit road in Hampstead, Walter Hartwright is accosted by a stranger dressed from head to toe in white. She asks the way to London, and no sooner has Walter directed her than he is overtaken by a carriage in pursuit of the mysterious woman, who has evidently escaped from an asylum. From this single incident, Walter unwinds a thrilling story of abduction, madness, false identity, and shameful family secrets. And then finally, we have The Case of the Brown-Eyed Maid by Clive Ryland. This is from 1951 and it is set in the UK, but that is all the information I could find about this book. <laughs> I didn't have, it doesn't have a dust jacket. 
and I could not find any information whatsoever about it online. So, if you've read anything by Clive Ryland, could you let me know? I would love to find out. Of course, I'm going to read this book, um, but having not read it yet, I can't really tell you anything about it. But it does have a color in the title. And then um, one recommendation from the police procedural category, and this is Wycliffe and the Pea Green Boat by W.J. Burley. This is from 1975, and it's the sixth in his Wycliffe series set in Cornwall. Tragedy seemed to stalk the Tremaine family. Sidney Tremaine had hanged himself for no obvious reason. His son Morley had had the misfortune to fall in love with a girl who slept around and get convicted of killing her. And now Cedric Tremaine was charged with murdering his wealthy father by blowing up his boat. Chief Superintendent Wycliffe knew something was wrong, knew that the apparently cut and dried case wasn't what it appeared to be. Carefully, he cast his bait and waited for the real killer to surface. And then one last recommendation. This is from the amateur sleuth category. And this is Oxford Blue by Veronica Stallwood. You could also use this for the prompt of place. This was written in 1998 and it is the sixth in this series. In an attempt to come to terms with the loss of her close friend, Andrew, Kate Ivory has escaped Oxford and found sanctuary in a friend's cottage a few miles away. Here, in the peace of the countryside, she hopes to find a healing tranquility and the inspiration for her next novel but it soon becomes evident that her new home is not all she had hoped it would be. She has barely had time to unpack before her gardener, Donna, is found dead in mysterious circumstances and Kate is reluctantly drawn into an investigation. Unconvinced by the official police verdict, she starts to uncover the feuds and illegal goings-on behind the genteel village facades. Why do the Hope Stanhopes refuse to speak to the Fullers? How did the Fullers make so much money so quickly? And what secret is the Reverend Widow's hiding? There is plenty of gossip and everyone has a theory about what happened to Donna, but Kate must relinquish her exile and return to Oxford before she can discover the truth. So there you have a few more recommendations that would fit the prompt of color. I hope this is helpful for you. Have you read any of these books? I would love to chat with you about them in the comment section down below. And Okay, here we go. I'm going to shake up the bag and we'll play another round of our Eminem manuscript matchup game. What are we going to get? Blue. Blue gives us setting. Very good. Ooh, where is it going to have to be set? Blue again gives us hotel. Okay, so we need to find a mystery book that is set in a hotel. Oops. Blue again, and so we'll institute the no repeat rule. that one. Okay, let's do it one more time. <laughs> Orange gives us detective. And blue gives us professional. Okay, so we need to find a book that is set in a hotel and features a professional detective. Good luck to you. I can't wait to see um, the books that you find that fit these prompts. Please put your, um, them in the comment section down below, and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.